Isaiah chapter 34, we're going to start by reading four verses. We will read them again in just a little bit. Continuing on in this marvelous study of the book of Isaiah, what an incredibly strong preacher and truthful preacher that he was. God gave him the message and he didn't back down for anybody. He just preached and preached and preached and prophesied just as God had told him to do. And tonight we're going to be looking at a very, very negative time uh, in the word of God concerning the end times. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday we will look at a very positive time that he's going to preach in the same sermon. And uh, I think you'll appreciate that. And uh, I'm glad I'm saved tonight. And I'm glad I'm saved, and I'm glad that what we're going to look at tonight doesn't involve me. I'm very, very thankful for that. I do feel badly for those whom it will affect, but it does not, it's not part of us. If you're born again tonight, if you're saved, this sermon is about the future, not about your future. Isaiah 34, I'm going to ask you to read with me verses 1 through 4, and uh, I'll read verse 1. You join me on verse 2, and then every other verse down through verse 4. And they are a little bit lengthy verses, and that's why we're going to sing like our sing. We're going to read like every other verse with me tonight. I'll read verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon the nations and his fury upon all their arm, uh, armies. Uh, he hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as the falling fig from the fig tree. And of course you recognize their part of a song that we sing here at the church about the heavens being rolled back as a scroll. But that's not going to be the sermon tonight. I want you to listen very carefully is we look at Isaiah with this subject matter in mind, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Heavenly Father, teach us now from your word. Help us, Lord, to be aware of what is in the future. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of heaven. Thank you for the promise of a rapture of all saints. And I ask you now that you'd help us, Lord, to even become more soul conscious as we hear about their future. In Jesus' name. Amen. And of course, you may be seated. In this section of Isaiah, he prophesies of what we call and what the Bible calls the day of the Lord and of Israel's restoration and the glory in the kingdom. So that's all in this prophecy. And we're only going to look at part of it tonight. There's no way we can cover all of it. Uh, I mean, I could, but you wouldn't like me very much if I did that. And I would prefer to keep a friend <laughs> rather than preach all night long. All right. And so old, listen here, uh, the day of the Lord. And often in the Old Testament, it's mentioned several times in the New Testament. And the New Testament calls the day of the Lord the day of wrath. New Testament calls it the day of visitation. New Testament refers to it as the great day of God Almighty. And by the way, that is found in the book of Revelation. And uh, it refers to a still futuristic fulfillment when God's wrath is poured out on unbelieving Israel and on the unbelieving world. So that's in prophecy. It's going to happen. When God made a prophecy and gave it to the man of God, the prophet, those things would come true. And there are prophecies that were given that have not yet come true. Though there are some who take things out of their proper context and they say, oh yeah, this is what we're living in right now. We are living in a day of tribulation, but we are not living in the tribulation. Understand that. That's a subject and a time in history, a future history. And so this is important for us to note tonight. And the scriptures indicate that the day of the Lord is going to come quickly. And all of us know the phrase as a thief in the night. I think all of us in the 70s were exposed to a series of uh, so-called Christian films, and one of them was simply entitled A Thief in the Night. Well, where did that come from? It partly comes from this prophecy. If you have your Bible there, 
I'd like you to go to two different places, one in the Old Testament and one in the New. First of all, the book of Zephaniah. If you're not sure where that is, you can look it up in your index in the front of your Bible. Uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. If you would prefer not to look it up, but merely to listen, that is okay too. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. My preacher said that if you have not found it by this time, just look intelligently at any book in your hand, and nobody will know the difference that whether you found it or not. So looking at Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, it says, The great day of the Lord is near. Now, understand the day of the Lord is talking about a time in the future. There it says, The great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wastiness, wastiness uh, and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and the alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be uh, poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to be uh, deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, uh, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even the speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. One might ask a question at this point. We're going to go to a New Testament passage as well that refers to this, but say, why in the world would Isaiah or any prophet in the Old Testament preach of a day so far in the future. The same reason that a pastor may preach on the rapture, which ain't happened yet, but it's coming. It could be tonight. I mean, before I go home tonight, uh, we could be raptured out of this world. The Bible teaches that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And there are some, I believe, listening to my voice tonight who do not believe that. But why do we preach that? I remember when I was uh, assistant pastor, youth director up in Minnesota, I got a hold of a Christian publication. I had it in my hands and I was reading it. And the question was, or I should say the title of the article was, why don't preachers preach on the rapture anymore? And I read what they said. And in the article, I even showed it to the pastor at that time and he laughed with me. They stopped preaching about the rapture because it hadn't happened yet. Well, duh. If it had happened, there would be no need to preach it anymore. So I showed it to him and he read it and he laughed as well. But why do we preach about the rapture? It hasn't happened yet, but we want Christians to be ready. We want Christians to be ready. Why? Because we want the unsaved to be ready. We want them to come to faith in Christ. Let them know that there's a day coming when the lost will be left behind, you see. Why do we preach about hell? You're not in it yet. Why do we preach about hell? Because... The Bible speaks of it, even though you may, be, you may be living right now, but you're not there. So why do we preach on it? Because it is real. Now, why did Isaiah preach about this day of wrath? Because it's coming. Though it hadn't come yet, and he wanted, God wanted through Isaiah to warn the people and let them know what the future was going to be like, even though it would not affect them right then. They needed to understand that there was a day coming. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 2 and 3, the word of God says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So there's that reference once again. And I remember that uh, the movie Thief in the Night, I saw it a couple of times when I was a teenager, I know that they were talking about the rapture happening, but this is not talking about the rapture happening as a thief in the night. It's talking about God's judgment during the tribulation period. Let me read the verse again. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety and sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So here is the reference, Old Testament and New Testament. 
You can mark that down. You can try to remember where it's at. And so we're going to divide this tonight, and we're going to be looking at, with all that in mind, we're going to take a look at the day of wrath. What's it going to be like on this earth? Now, we could go to the New Testament. We could go into Revelation. We could read what's happening there because the tribulation period does not happen until Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. After Revelation 4 and verse 1, uh, almost to the end of the book, it's talking about the tribulation period and the great tribulation period. We could go there, but that's not what we're studying tonight. We've already studied Revelation twice now in this church and numerous sermons from Revelation since. But not tonight we're looking at what Isaiah was told to tell the people of God because of their disobedience and turning away from the Lord. So first of all, we're going to look at, if you're taking notes, point number one, God's grievous punishment. God's grievous punishment. And there was a judgment upon all nations. And these verses that we're going to look at now refer to the coming great tribulation period. What's the difference? Tribulation period is seven years long. Now, you remember this from when we studied Revelation. That's kind of a review. The tribulation period spoken of is a seven-year period on this earth after God's people are taken out of this world. The first half of the tribulation period is characterized basically by peace. The last three and a half years of, Revel of, the, great, of the tribulation period is called the Great Tribulation, and that's when the devil is unleashed. That's when literally all hell breaks loose on this planet as God's wrath is poured out. I said that, that phrase pop properly though many people do not use it properly. Literally, all of hell is going to be turned loose on this earth. So, first of all, look with me, if you would, please. And we read these uh, verses a moment ago in our opening, uh, opening scripture. Uh, first of all, the world's armies are going to be destroyed. The world's armies are going to be destroyed. Look at chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. Come near, ye nations, to hear and hearken. Ye people, let the earth hear. And all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it, for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. Uh, he, sh he hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. So the first part of this time, he says here that the world's armies are going to be destroyed, and the Lord's anger is going to be brought down upon them. That is a scary thought. When you think about uh, those who are unsaved, they're going to have God's wrath poured out on them, of all things. Second truth that is found here, the Bible says that the mountains will flow with the blood of unburied corpses. We have heard in our news lately, it's something that has made national news, about a so-called mortuary south of us that cheated a lot of people out of a lot of money and left the dead corpses in the building for only the Lord knows how long. What an incredible, egregious sin against those families that were grieving. And uh, they've now condemned the building, I believe. They're going to end up tearing it down because of the rot that went on inside because the bodies were left there to rot. And we find here <clears throat> that the Bible prophesies of a time when the dead bodies are not going to be buried. Follow along. Um, Isaiah 34 and verse 3, it says, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted uh, with their blood. So we can relate to that because of what's been in our newscast here in Colorado. And those across the nation who have watched on their newscast about the atrocities of that particular place down south of us. I think it's near Penrose. Can you imagine what it would have been like? I, I don't understand why people did not smell that place before it was discovered, of all things. One day I was driving out of uh, Manitou Springs, and I was going there uh, past Serpentine, went around on the roundabout. By the way, do you know how roundabouts came about? devil went to the Lord and said, let me create something. And God said, no way. He said, you got to create all these things. You made animals and you created people and you put all this. He said, I'm just asking to be able to do one miracle. And God said, all right, I'll let you create one thing. And he let him create roundabouts. <laughs> and that's probably the worst invention of the entire world is a roundabout. Well, anyway, enough of that. 
I was pulling out of Manitou Springs, and I went under the bridge and started up, and boy, I tell you, just the smell of rotting flesh. Well, you know, people can get hit on the highway, animals can get I thought somebody had died or maybe gotten hit by a car, and stink had set in. You remember what the Bible said about Lazarus being in the, in the tomb for four days? And they said, behold, he stinketh. Well, I immediately called our, uh, uh, called our Linda, and I asked her, she might want to check it out. Found out it was a deer that had gotten hit that was in that way of rotting. But it was just an animal, one animal. And it smelled up that entire area. It was sickening when I drove past it. Can you imagine what it would have been like down there at that mortuary? With all, they found a hundred and what was it? A hundred and eighteen? A hundred and eighty? A hundred and eighty bodies that were uncared for. It was, it was so sad. And I'm just surprised that there wasn't anybody that turned that in before it actually got discovered. I mean, 180 bodies put off a powerful heap of smell. The Bible says in verse 3, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. The bodies of the dead are going to be left unburied in that day. And then the uh, third fact to give you about this, the judgment upon all nations, is that the heavens are going to dissolve, and the Bible says even the stars will fail of all things. Look at verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. They're going to be like withered leaves and falling that fall from a tree. That's just what it's going to be like during that day. That's not a pretty picture at all. And these people today, you witness to them and they say, no, I don't want to get saved. I, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I don't want, oh, when I die, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to party with all my buddies and we're going to have tailgate parties and we're going to drink beer is what we're going to do. And we're just going to get drunk down in hell. That's not going to be that way. It's not that way in hell, and it's not going to be that way during the tribulation period, during that time on this earth when God's wrath is poured out. Judgment is going to come upon one nation, the doomed nation of Edom. So let me look here now. The next thing that I want you to see is the severity of God's judgment. The severity. You say, Pastor, how can you go to a point that talks about severity with what you just read? Follow along. We find out that Edom's people are going to be cut down like animals. Edom's people are going to be cut down like animals. Chapter 34, beginning in verse 5, follow along. It says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. And with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of the rams. For the Lord hath sacrificed in Basra, uh, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Uh, and the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with all with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked, shall be soaked. Did you see that? Shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy in Zion. The Bible tells us here very plainly, if we can just leave this out, I know your questions are, what's a unicorn? It's a one horned animal. Uh, it's not the horse that's pink and purple and white and, and all the rest of it today. Sorry to blow your, uh, your thoughts about that. It was a single-horned animal, and uh, please understand that. But it's the Lord's sword. It's going to be covered in blood and fat as it is used for sacrifices, you see. When they talk about the fat and being on the sword and the blood being on the sword, when they would cut into the animal and sacrifice the animal, that, that was not a clean slice, so to speak, but what was in the animal came out on the sword that was used or the knife that was sword, used to sacrifice the animal. And so God says the Lord's sword is going to be covered with blood and with fat, as if it was used for sacrifices. Notice the next thing about this is the ground's going to be covered with fire. The ground is going to be covered with fire. 
the Bible says in verse 9, chapter 34 and verse 9, it says, And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. And even the streams are going to be filled with burning pitch. And I think that we here in this area can relate to this with something that happened to us a little more than 10 years ago when the fire broke out on the mountain. Remember that? And an incredible, the Haman fire, and one of the worst in history of Colorado. And as it burned, I remember we had to come down to the church here. We grabbed things that were valuable that were not able to be replaced. We grabbed all the financial records. I grabbed my musical instruments at my two guitars. And uh, Brother Penn and his sons were here, and we were just loading up everything that we could. And they almost weren't going to let us through because they were evacuating Manitou Springs. You could see the, you could see the sparks and the uh, embers as they would fly. It was amazing. We got in here and clean, we, Brother Penn even got a uh, video of it, uh, of our what we did that night. And uh, they said on top of the mountain, the fire was so intense. The, the ground turned into like pitch, like like tar. I mean, it just made, they said there wouldn't anything grow on top of the mountain for at least 10 years. And things are beginning to grow up there now. But when you look at that, when we're driving down the mountain and coming to church and we look up there at the top and there's just still trees burned, you can see the entire line of burned trees. Talk, and it was a hot fire. And they said it was just one of the worst that ever was here in Colorado. And of course, there's been a number of fires in Colorado. And right now, if you get on highway, um, if you're going north to Denver and you're, you're out there driving up and you're going uh, past Deckers and all that, you, you drive by devastation from a fire where things were burned up. Well, in that day, the fire is going to be very, very hot. It's going to be like pitch. It's going to melt things down. Amazing day. And then uh, the next thing about that is simply this. The land's going to become desolate, you can imagine and uninhabitable. It'll be become desolate and uninhabitable. Well, what we've described so far sounds bad enough, but then God says, and you'll be able to live there. Chapter 34, verses 10 through 15, you have your Bible there. As I read it to you, try to follow along. It shall not be quenched night nor day. Wow, what a prophecy. The fire will not be quenched night or, nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. And the generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever, but the cormorant uh, and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also shall, and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon in the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all the princes shall be, uh, shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces. Nettles and brambles and fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and uh, a court for owls. Speaking of dragons, tonight when I came in uh, to the church, I went, down, I went downstairs. And in the hallway, I saw a little animal that was down there. It was a little, a little lizard. We get lizards around here. And a tiny thing. I mean, I mean, it was just little. Uh, and I started to reach down to pick him up because I was going to take him outside for a walk. And uh, when I tried to reach for him, he started moving all of his legs just like this. And he could hardly move because on his tail there was a spider web. And he could not push himself across the floor. So I reached down with my hand and I picked him up and I pulled the spider web off of his tail. And I was talking to him. All the way. Now, he didn't understand most of what I said. And I walked him out to the back door of the church and I opened it up and I let him go up there on the side of the, of the side of the hill. And he was happy to get out of here. Well, the Bible says here that there's going to be lizards, lots and lots of lizards that are going to be dwelling there because that's all that can. And it says, uh, the thorns shall come up in, their pal in her palaces, nettles and brambles and fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The, beast, uh, the wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the uh, satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech of the owl shall rest there and find 
for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures and uh, also be gathered, every one with her mate, but not one single human being. Uninhabitable. God's judgment is pretty thorough. There's just, there was nothing left. Now, he shared that with them to say, this is in your, this is in the future of these people. And he gave them one last thing I want to show you. And that was a promise that it was going to happen. The surety of God's judgment. Look at verses 16 and 17. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them, and he hath cast the lot for them, and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They, have, they shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. And here's what God said. He said, I'm writing a guarantee, putting it in writing. He said, this is going to happen. He wanted the people to know. Uh, when you witness to someone and they say, oh, I don't believe that, it doesn't matter. You don't have to believe it for it to be true. Uh, if God said it, that settles it. End of report. And that's what he wanted the people to know, that this was something that was not negotiable. This was something that was going to happen. And so he made that clear to them by simply saying, we're going to put it in a book, line for line. It's going in a book. Well, here we are. We've got it in a book. And he wanted them to know that. And so he guarantees all of this by putting it in writing, by putting it in writing. You know, it might be in writing, but a lot of people don't sign things, and therefore they say that their, their contract is no good because they didn't sign it. Well, God signed it in blood, and here we have it. We have it in our Bibles. It's going to happen. So I do want to take a moment here to remind all of us this. I told you tonight was going to be a negative thing, that what it was going to be like in the future. So we learned some things about the tribulation period. We learn some things about God's people, what many of them are going to go through if they don't get saved. They need to get saved, get forgiven, and they need to, the nation needs to turn to God, and that is prophesied in the Word of God. They're God's people. They're not necessarily saved people. They're the nation that God has chosen, but they need to get saved if they're going to go to heaven. You see, even in the Old Testament, the gospel was preached, and what is the gospel? The death, burial, and what? Resurrection of Christ. We know that from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2 where it says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them that the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. They heard the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. They heard about it. They did not hear the name Jesus necessarily, but they knew that what was going to happen because the gospel was preached to them. And so... I want to remind all of us that this takes place during what we know as the Great Tribulation Period, that last three and a half years of the Tribulation Period, which lasts for seven years total. And so, as we have learned in the past, the first three and a half years of the Tribulation Period are characterized basically by peace. The last three and a half years are characterized by the devil being turned loose. We've got the Antichrist, and we've got all these different things going on. And everything is unleashed with God's wrath during that time. But all I want to be reminded, once again, is we're not going to be here. There are many today that say, oh, Christians are not going to be delivered from the rapture or from the tribulation period. They say the rapture comes after the tribulation period or it comes middle of the tribulation period. Or they say there is no rapture at all, as many people even believe yet today. I guess that's because it ain't happened yet. Well, just because it ain't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But we're not going to be here. We're going to be taken out of this whole world. And we're going to be with the Lord Jesus. And we're going to be delivered from that. Just like when you got saved, you were delivered from the pangs of hell itself. And here we are, we'll be delivered from this time of wrath, of God's wrath being poured out. And I realize, as someone might say, well, this is to the Jews, isn't it? Well, yeah, but you can't affect one group of people in the world without affecting everybody in the world. And so this is going to be happening all over the world. 
We're going to be raptured out of this world when Jesus returns and we're going to meet him in the air and forever we will be in the, in the air. And the Bible says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so tonight, I just want you to know, if you're saved, you're not going to be here during that time. And if you are not saved, you need to get saved before the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first. And we which are alive and remain are caught up together because after that, you may not have an opportunity to come to faith in Christ. So that's... First Thessalonians makes that very clear. First and second Thessalonians both. And so what I'm saying to us tonight, thank God we're not going to be here during that time, but learn now what the unsaved, unrepentant Jews are going to go through. And the same thing's true for those who would not turn to God. They would not put their faith in trust and they're going to be a part of this. So anyway, that's my message for tonight. Now, next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to look at another aspect and another aspect of this time. And it's a happy time. And so if you're discouraged about what you heard tonight, try to hang on for another week. We're going to preach something real good and positive that Isaiah preached uh, along with this sermon. And someone preaches on hell. They've also, they've got to preach on heaven too. And today when I was talking to Kevin, I said, I want to show you two really negative things. And then I want to show you two really positive things. Say, what did you share with him? That we're all sinners and hell deserving and not heaven deserving. And then what did you show him? <laughs> Wages of sin is death. Christ died for us. And that was the good news. And you know, the truth of the matter is God gives these people a warning. And then next week, we're going to see the blessing that he shares with his people. Let's all stand, shall we?